to everybody who's listening, hello and good evening. My name is Jake Martel. I'm really happy to join you all. Um, just before we get moving, though, I would like to acknowledge that for any of you who are here in London, because there may be some of you that aren't, um, but for any of us who are here in London, um, we would like to begin by acknowledging the treaty territory of the Anishinaabeg, which is defined within the pre-Confederation Treaty, known as the London Township Treaty of 1796. Um, throughout this time, the region has also become current home to the Haudenosaunee people and the Lenni Lenape nations as well. Um, and so we just want to say a great thanks for uh, sharing the land and having been good stewards of it um, for as long as our First Nations communities have. Um, okay, so you can set us on the next slide there, Kelsey. Uh, perfect. So tonight we're going to talk about Reforest London a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about tree care basics, okay? So that's going to involve planting, watering, mulching, pruning. We'll get into a little bit of stuff about pests and diseases, talk about some other threats to trees. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about some of London's bylaws, um, and again, that content will be really specific to the people who are right here in London. Um, but I would encourage any of you who are outside the city limits of London to take a look at your own bylaws and see if there's something else that's in place. Um, because a lot of municipalities are really starting to wake up to the fact that we need our green leafy friends. And uh, they're taking steps to make sure that that happens. Okay, so next up um yep yeah, go ahead so uh reforest london was founded in 2005 as part of the urban league of london and um since the beginning they've planted 76,622 trees and shrubs they've worked with 61,441 volunteers and they've run over 340 events and that's just in 2019 guys um, so when you think about that, you know, averaging 300 events a year, uh, <laughs> going all the way back to 2005, um, there's been quite an impact that Reforest, is London, Reforest London has made. Um, these guys are superheroes who not only change the way I think about trees, but also change the way I think about volunteering. And uh, hopefully there'll be a chance for everybody to get involved and do something. I had hoped to plant trees side by side with many of you who are listening tonight by now, um, but of course nature had other plans for us. A next slide, please. So some of the programs that Reforest London runs, they have a program called Seeds to Forest. Now I'm not very familiar with Seeds to Forest, although one of the things that I do know that Reforest London has done um, in past years, because I've been a part of it myself, is that um, we collect seeds, um, specifically for trees that are at risk. Um, so, for example, um, we'll get into some of the trees that are at risk a little bit later on, some of the ones that have been affected by invasive species and so on and so forth. So, you know, we collected ash seeds so that we would be able to replant the ash trees that have been lost to the borer. Um, and those kinds of things. Um, we also do park naturalizations. Park naturalizations are really interesting because what we want to try and do is as much as possible um, have trees that um, will sustain themselves. Um, so, I mean, yes, it's a park. Um, obviously, it's not nature. Um, because there are boundaries to the park and all of those things, but we want all the trees within those parks to grow as naturally as possible. Um, it's one of the reasons why we pick uh, native tree species. We also have tree depots, which is where we give away trees for free to people who have the capacity to plant said trees on their property. Um, Reforest London's mandate, of course, is to make sure that these trees are planted in London. So again, for any of those of you who are listening from outside our city limits, um, there may be some uh, issues with tree depots just because uh, we kind of want them to bolster the canopy of the forest city. 
Celebration Forest. So if you haven't heard about Celebration Forest already, it is a place, it's on the Talbot Land Trust right behind Parkwood Hospital in London, Ontario, and on the site of Reforest London. Um, and that forest is maintained. We plant trees there as part of a fundraiser. And those trees are planted as memorials to people who we have lost, also to celebrate the achievements of people. Um, and so over the years, a lot of trees have anchored a lot of memories for us in that, in, in, in that forest for us. Um, seedling giveaways, which often happen at tree planting events. Usually there's a little table of trees that people can take away, tiny little seedlings. And then tree cycle. So tree cycle is all about giving people tax receipts for donations of trees that grew on their property um, that they can't care for or that they, you know, maybe there's a conflict with uh, their landscape strategy. And so, you know, they want to get rid of this one particular species of tree, but they also care about this living thing. Uh, and want to see it go to a good home. Um, so they come out to Reforest London, they drop their tree off, and we give them a tax receipt. Um, so those are just some of the programs that we run. There are others. Next slide, please. Uh, so seeds to forest, and this is the one that I didn't know a lot about, and maybe this is why I didn't know a lot about it, because it looks like it is geared specifically for schools, um, school programs. So during COVID-19, of course, all of those schools have gone online, much like we are today. And so seeds to forest is still happening, but people are learning about it digitally. Um, we have put all of the spring plantings on hold, um, but we may actually try and push it. Normally we try to get the planting season out of the way by June because that's when it's starting to get hot. So, you know, if there are any plantings in June, they tend to be like first week only. Um, because of this situation that we found ourselves in though, we may actually end up doing some plantings uh, later in June and July. Um, in order to uh, try and satisfy our mission. Um, we've still got a lot of trees to plant. So, um, and then we do plan to um, have contact-free pickup, possibly from the office, if you know where that is. Uh, and they are uh, hoping to be able to have fruit tree depots again. So our Celebration Forest event almost always happens in May and it's been postponed until September 12th. Seedling giveaways are on hold and the tree cycle is also on hold this spring. Next up. Very unfortunate news. Um, I'm gonna pop in just briefly. I'm trying to respond to someone's chat question and um, it wasn't letting me respond. So I'll just respond here. Someone asked, will there be access to this presentation if I have to step out partway through? Absolutely. So this will be sent to everybody who signed up on Eventbrite, regardless of how long you stay. Um, and also I just wanted to add, yeah, Seeds to Forest is um, the new name of our school program. So it started having that name in 2018. And right now, um, as it stands, we, we go to about 30 schools a year, elementary schools to um, plant some seedlings, uh, plant trees in their schoolyard, get the, the kids involved to help identify what trees to plant. Um, and then also they come out to our office next to the Westminster Ponds area to go for a hike to see what the trees will look like when they grow up. Um, so that's a bit of details about that. And so right now uh, we've kind of transformed it into an online um, uh, set of resources where we have a specific newsletter people can sign up to to get those activities sent, sent to them. Um, so I'll talk a little bit at the very end too about it, but yeah, that's for that. And yeah, the plantings unfortunately won't be happening in spring, but hopefully in the fall. All right, that's it for me, thanks. All righty, so next up, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Million Tree Challenge. Um, so that is, our overarching goal, we do hope to get to a million trees planted in the city of London. And boy, the party on the day when that happens is going to be legendary, let me tell you that much. 
Um, but there is this amazing website, milliontrees.ca, that you can go to. This allows you to, when you plant a tree yourself, so let's say you plant one in your yard, um, you can take a picture of that tree and you can actually post it on the Million Tree Challenge. Um, you can send messages to your friends to guilt trip them into planting trees and posting them on the Million Tree Challenge as well. Um, when Reforest does their large planting events, they usually record the numbers themselves um, and add that to the Million Tree Challenge website. So if we do resume plantings and you guys get to come out with us, um, don't record the trees that you plant with us because they will already be recorded and we don't want to count them twice. But if you plant trees on your own property, certainly uh, check out that website. There's also lots of really cool stuff on there like um, a carbon sink calculator so that you can determine um, how much carbon the trees that you have planted have taken out of the air or will take out of the air. Uh, over their projected lifespans. It is a really super cool website and I would advise everybody to check it out. Next. All right, so the basics of tree care. Um, you want to start with a wide hole. Um, now, what I would say is, you know, if you're planting a tree for the first time, you've got the tree, it's already in a pot. Your hole has to be big enough for that entire pot to sink down into, it should actually be bigger. Um, you don't have to go any more than twice as big as the pot, um, but what happens is that if the earth around the freshly planted tree's root system is hard packed, the roots of the tree are so used to growing around in circles in the pot of uh, that they've been kept in, that they don't know that they can grow out into this new fresh soil and actually grow a root structure that's going to support their tremendous mass as they age. So we make the hole bigger than the flower pot so that when we put the soil back, it's going to be loose around the root ball which is going to allow those roots to, to, to be aware that they can grow into it and penetrate it. Um, the other thing that you'll want to do before you actually put the root ball into the hole that you've dug um, is you'll, you, when you pull it out of the pot, you'll probably see roots growing around in circles. And you got to kind of tease those roots out so that they look like spaghetti. You don't want to lose a lot of the soil that was in the pot, um, but you want the roots to break that conditioning of growing in circles. Um, your hole, when it says not too deep, the hole needs to be as deep as the level of dirt that's in the pot that you're transplanting the tree from, okay? So, um, and then, so you, you, you know, you put your tree into this hole that's twice as big and exactly as deep. Um, you fill it back up and then you do a tug test. The tug test is just to make sure that the tree has enough support, that it's not going to blow over in a strong breeze. Or, you know, if a predator tries to, happens to come along and tries to eat one of the leaves, it's not going to walk away with the entire tree. Uh, next thing you want to do is throw down some mulch. Mulch serves a lot of purposes. Um, it retains the moisture in the soil um, by protecting it from the rays of the sun. Uh, mulch in time also gradually breaks down, which replenishes the nutrients in the soil. Um, now, when you put your mulch down, uh, one of the things that you're going to want to make sure of is that you don't have that mulch in contact with the trunk of the tree because when mulch gets wet, it starts to rot and break down. And if it is in contact with other wood when it does that, that other wood will also start to rot and break down. And of course, we're talking about your beautiful living tree here. Um, so you don't want that to happen. 
Um, in terms of water, the best way to water a tree is gradually. You don't want to give it a whole bunch of water all at once and flood it out. So what a lot of people do is they'll go out and they'll get like five gallon pails or 10 gallon pails and they drill small holes in the pail. Um, so that the water kind of creeps out, seeps out gradually. Um, and then they can move that pail around the tree to make sure that all of the parts of the root system that are under the ground and not visible are getting some of that water. So next slide. Okay, so things not to do, right? And we already talked about some of these, but not a whole lot of them. The first guy there is somebody who appears to be over pruning his tree. Um, you know, I mean, nice guy, because he wants to pay attention to his foliage. Um, but sometimes people are a little overzealous. And if you take too many of the leaves away, then the tree can't produce enough food to support itself. So you always have to be careful how many healthy leaves get taken away um, when you go pruning. Um, weed whackers are very, very dangerous to trees um, because they can strip the bark off the base of the tree. So you wanna make sure that you do not put a weed whacker close to the base of the tree. Um, Reforce London also really, really recommends avoiding pesticides and uh, commercial fertilizers and those sorts of things. Um, again, you know, we're very interested in naturalization. We plant only the trees that are most likely to survive. So, you know, when, when you go to a Reforest London planting event, what you don't know is that they've already analyzed the soil type. Not only are they getting only native trees to that site, they're also taking a look at the ones that will best grow for that soil type. Um, and so if you are looking to plant trees in your backyard, might help you to know what your soil types are, which is kind of outside of the scope for this particular presentation. Um, but if you're interested in getting involved with Reforest London as a serious and committed volunteer, this rabbit hole goes deep and they will teach you those things. Um, in terms of fertilizers, you know, a lot of people like them, but um, it can be difficult. Some of them are chemical based. Um, and even the ones that are nature based, um, you know, they'll, they'll supercharge the soil for a while. Um, but you know, it's, it's still going to suffer a regular de depletion cycle, um, sort of thing. Um, so we, we kind of suggest avoiding those things. Um, there can be other complications with use of chemicals and such. So next one up. So when things go wrong, you can see this tree has had some bad days. Um, let's, uh, no matter how careful you are, um, there are always going to be situations that you um, have difficulty anticipating. Um, we can tell you about some of these things in advance to try and prevent you from uh, falling into that trap. Um, but, you know, caring for a tree can be kind of like caring for a pet, right? It's a commitment. Um, next slide. Let's get into some of the specific things that can go wrong. So this is a tree that I suspect was probably nicked uh, in its infancy um, by a weed whacker and did not properly grow. So you can see that it's missing this little wedge where it wasn't able to grow. The rest of the tree is trying to grow, um, but you can see by looking obviously that that's a little bit unstable. Um, if I were the person who owned this tree, one of the things that I would be concerned about is that it looks like the divot is missing on the house side because I can see a sidewalk in the distance. So if that tree falls, it's going to fall towards the cutout. And this picture makes it look like that cutout might be pointing towards somebody's house. Bad situation. 
Next up. Okay, so when trees <laughs> when trees grow, um, you know, it's not like a whole branch just sort of starts to grow, right? It starts as a little um, a little spindle which could easily fit through the holes in a chain link fence, um, and then it starts to grow and grow and grow. And eventually you get a situation where the chain link is running through the middle of the tree. And then as the tree grows taller, what it's going to do is pull the entire fence out of the ground. Um, so be careful about planting along fence lines. Next up. Okay, so when you're watering a tree, um, it has its own canopy. Okay, everything under its own canopy is inside what we call the drip line um, because it means that that patch of soil is going to be a little bit more sheltered from falling rain um, than the rain that falls outside the drip line right um, and so when you are watering a tree getting water inside the drip line um, is a good way to go because that soil could be more parched than the soil that's outside of the drip line, um, you're also guaranteed that a significant root mass for the tree is going to exist inside the drip line. Whereas if you're outside of the drip line, you don't know how much root mass is actually there. Um, and so you may be dropping water down onto earth that has no roots under it. Um, so that's why we suggest watering inside. And remember, I was telling you about those five gallon buckets that we drill the slow release holes into. Um, you can see one of those over on the right hand side of the screen. Um, somebody else is doing this just with a hose over on the left hand side of the screen. But I think what you'll notice is that that hose is not turned on to its full capacity, right? So they're not flooding. Um, again, they're trying to let it trickle out. And um, over the watering period, they're probably going to relocate those sources of water. Um, okay. Um, I'm just taking a look at this question here. Uh, this is a long one. Oh, you do see the questions. That's good. If you'd yeah. like, I can uh, I can watch them and ask them if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it looks like I think Trent has already commented on that one. Trent, by the way, is somebody who's probably already forgotten more about trees than I will ever know because he does it for a living. I'm just a volunteer. <laughs> um, so how mulch works and we got into some of this a little bit earlier. Um, so you can see that it keeps sunlight from reaching the soil, which minimizes evaporation. Um, and then you can also see that orange arrow pointing down. Uh, as organic mulch breaks down, it releases nutrients that plants use. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, when without mulch, um, trees get really stressed, right? They may actually start to wilt and suffer. Um, before they're in irretrievable harm. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, again, they're <laughs> like, they're living things, right? Um, and just like us, when we don't get enough to eat and when we don't get enough to drink, we're not very happy. Um, we tend to walk around wilted, um, which is what can happen to your trees without the mulch. Because uh, it works as your moisture guard and it works as an organic fertilizer um, it also helps keep the weeds away as well because any of the seeds for weeds that are underneath the mulch will not be touched by sunlight, which means they cannot make themselves grow. Um, so those are all the different ways our mulch helps us. I would never plant a tree without it. Uh, next up. So yes, we talked a little bit about this as well. We need to have that flat donut and you can see the picture in the circle. It kind of looks like they piled it up. Whereas our big display picture, you'll notice how flat that mulch is 
uh, onto the ground. It's only two to possibly four inches deep, but it doesn't get any deeper as you get closer to the tree. And you can see the space that they've left so that the mulch isn't actually in contact with the trunk of the tree uh, in order to prevent that trunk rot situation that we talked about a little bit earlier. Next up. And there's the mulch volcano. Very, very, very bad. Um, I'm not sure why our little critter is looking so closely at that mulch volcano uh, as uh, some of the other pictures, but you can see um, the rot in that picture over on the left-hand side at the top. Um, again, you know, there was probably just too much wet wood in contact with the base of that tree um, until that I mean, it eventually rotted enough that the tree fell over, um, is kind of what you're looking at. So next. Uh, you know, while we're on the topic of mulch, there's a couple more mulch-related questions, if that's okay. Uh, cool. Does this mulch thing apply to mature trees or just newly planted trees? It's most important with newly planted trees because they're going to struggle the most to survive. Having said that though, I think that all trees can really benefit from mulch. Um, it's almost like asking, can you be too healthy? By the time a tree gets to its maturity or starts to approach its maturity, um, its root system will be deep and wide and it probably can fend for itself but again right you can never be too healthy so i wouldn't suggest going and spending a fortune on mulch for mature trees but if you happen to have some extra mulch it's never going to harm a tree um, and it certainly does provide the same benefits to mature trees that it does to young ones um, obviously with a larger tree, you're looking at more mulch though, so it can get a little costly. Your younger ones are the ones that are most important to protect. Awesome, um, thanks. And, yep. oh, and Trent, yeah, you can jump in too if you ever have any extra points. Okay. But if you're good, I do have one more question. Um, sure. I just planted a tree that came with a burlap sack holding the roots together. The tag on the tree said to plant it with the burlap still wrapped around it. Should I dig it up and replant it or is it okay the way it is? I would not dig it up and replant it because you're going to stress it out. Um, what, what, what I tend to suggest with things like these is like I will put it in the hole with the burlap bag around it but once it's in the hole, you know, I might um, cut some of the strips of burlap to create openings and things like that. Now, the thing about burlap, like I said, just like uh, the branches on a tree, when the roots grow, they're really small and spindly. They're like, they're like little needles. Um, and so it's going to be able to fit through the weave of the burlap, which is why they tell you that it's okay to leave it in. Um, but again, you know, some of the things that I was talking about earlier in terms of like training the roots to be to, so that they know they can grow outward again, right? Um, you know, that applies just as much to like a burlap sack uh, as it does to a flower pot. Um, and so, you know, I mean, just to be on the safer side, I would, you know, try to put slits in the burlap or cuts in the burlap that would create a clear path for roots to grow and again you know if that's the instructions that you got from the nursery they are absolutely suggesting to you that the initial roots will be so fine that they're going to be able to penetrate the weave of the burlap and that's why i would suggest do not dig the tree back up um, transplanting trees is very stressful for them you heard me talk about tree stress when i was talking about water and you know you, you don't want to cause any undue stress um 
So that would be my recommendation. Uh, Jake, awesome. uh, this is Trent. Um, I just thought I'd, uh, I just thought I'd quickly say hello, uh, but I just want to say I agree with everything you're saying there. Um, I awesome. did reply privately to a couple people. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's coming up in the chat. Some of my replies. I'm trying to kind of repost questions now because there's some really awesome questions. I think um, other people would love to uh, see, and it could help other people and answer their questions as well. Um, does everyone uh, see uh, the questions? Uh, if you do, maybe uh, just write a post on the side if you can see any of the replies that I'm doing. I'm pretty sure that um, the organizers can see, but the attendees can only message the organizers. So not everybody can see other people's questions. Um, and okay. plus saying it out loud is great because it gets in the recording too. Absolutely, okay. Yeah, I've got I've got a record of all the questions. The window that they're in is really small, so if it's a long question, it gets chopped, and then I have to scroll up. Um, but I do see them there. If if either of you guys see questions that are like super important though, because I'm just in babble mode here, um, definitely give me a shout out and let me know that I'm missing people. So I'll so just add one more comment that someone put was uh, you don't want any of the burlap to remain above the ground. It wicks water up away from the roots. So that's a comment someone made. Oh, excellent observation. Cool. Okay. All right, we can move on. Yep. Next, we're looking at pruning. Uh, so, you know, I mean, here's the thing about pruning, right? um all plants want to grow towards the light they are going to try and put as much of their green leafy surface into sunlight as they possibly can which means sometimes you're going to see a tree that wants to grow more on one side than another and um, that might not fit with your aesthetic desires but it is the tree trying to give itself the greatest chance of survival. So, I mean, in terms of like all of the folks who are thinking in terms of naturalization, right? As opposed to these sculpted, manicured, artificial gardens, um, people who are thinking naturalization, you know, we're, we're, would probably only recommend pruning trees in order to avoid situations like that chain link fence that we showed you earlier or um, the possibility of heavy branches uh, being blown down in a windstorm and falling onto the roof of your house you know those kinds of issues are the sorts of things that you want to have in your mind um, when you are deciding how much pruning that you want uh, to do um, one thing that's really, really, really important is that you never, ever want to prune the leading branch um, or, or cut off the top of the tree um, because that's something that can actually cap the tree's growth. Like it can actually stunt the tree, it can cause all kinds of serious problems. So you always want to avoid doing that um, again, you want to always think about how much leaf mass you're removing from the tree when you prune. Um, they need as many square inches of green leafy mass in order to photosynthesize. And the bigger the tree, the more leaf mass it needs because it needs to create more food. Um, so you know the notes here say sparingly or not at all and basically what i would say is your your pruning for hazard avoidance and your pruning for health um, in terms of trimming hedges for aesthetics hmm, i don't know there's a lot of mixed feelings on that <laughs> um, a lot of the issues that we have with invasive species um is also something that happened for those in in part um because you know a lot of people like those really pretty manicured gardens that are not necessarily natural 
Um, so look out for that. Um, broken and damaged branches, obviously, is something that you would want to um, get rid of. Um, that can also help kind of improve the health of the tree. Um, if you have dead or diseased branches, again, they'll be obvious to you because they will be missing leaves. And, you know, cutting off the part that doesn't have the leaves on it when the rest of the tree is healthy and green um, shouldn't really pose that many problems to the tree because it's not like it's losing any of its photosynthesis. So I think that's now Trent, you may have some more information about pruning um, than I do. I'm an apartment dweller, guys. So one of the reasons I joined Reforest oh, Learning is that I get to transplant trees vicariously. <laughs> So uh, I've never had an opportunity to take care of one like this. Yeah, no, um, obviously I think uh, you hit everything, um, the nail on the head with pruning. I think in a naturalization setting, there's nothing better than just seeing a wild tree, you know, that's hasn't been touched, uh, just kind of a gnarly looking tree. But uh, in, a, in an urban environment, we have to kind of step in to make sure that we reduce hazards. Um, I do have one question here just quickly from Julia. Um, she says she has an old tree um, and it's probably sick. It started to grow uh, little leaves at the base of the tree, which is actually called epicormic growth, Julia, uh, which I know is a sign of struggling. Uh, should I remove those little branches at the bottom to help it? Um, and, and Julia, I wouldn't remove those branches. Um, uh, and, and I would actually get that assessed probably by an arborist if it is an urban tree. Um, those branches are a sign of, of um, stress in the tree. Uh, but keep an eye on it. Uh, keep an eye on the canopy of the tree. And uh, if you're seeing some dieback um, or some branches dying off, it might be a good idea to contact an arborist to take a look at it for you. And that's all for me, Jake. All righty. Okay, let's move on. So here we go. Um, these are some questions about sick trees, right? Is my tree dying? And basically what we say is that if it has, um, if it has less than a third of the tree without leaves, the tree may still be able to survive because it's still got two thirds of its leaves providing photosynthesis for it. However, if it's missing one third of its leaves, it is going to start experiencing that stress as it struggles to supply its mass with enough food. Um, you might also be starting to think about what's going on with those other branches that don't have the leaf mass on them. Um, and could some of those be trimmed? Would that improve the health of the tree? Um, because if it's still got two thirds of its leaves, there is still a fighting chance that that tree is going to be okay. If it has less than two thirds of its leaves still remaining, that's when it's really gonna start to struggle. And it's, it's kind of downhill from there. Um, so again, you know, if you can get in touch with the folks in the city, um, if it's on public property, you know, you can give the city a call to talk about it, especially if you suspect it's a disease, because if it's the only tree on the block that's got it, they're going to want to contain that um, before it can spread to other trees. And then, um, you know, if it's on your own private property, then the city is not necessarily going to come out to look at that but um you know like trent said you could always get in touch with an arborist um and have somebody come out and look and make a recommendation for you one of the things about tree diseases we'll get into that a little bit later is that they tend to be very specific so they target certain types of trees only so you know for example if you've got one ash tree in a neighborhood and that tree is infested with borers um 
that tree is going to have a really rough time, but there aren't a whole lot of other ash trees that can then be infected by that borer. And the borer only eats ash trees. So, I mean, eventually those guys that are eating that tree are going to die because they will run out of food. Um, whereas if it's a neighborhood full of ash trees, you got to get the city out there quick and they will take measures because we don't want to lose them all. Um, you can also see the big splits um, that happen in the top corner, a um, little bit of the fungal growths, uh, the picture in the bottom corner. And again, those things are not necessarily fatal to your tree if it still has two thirds of its leaves or more. Uh, okay, next. This is the last slide for this section before we get into pests and diseases. So, um, and there's a lot of questions coming in. So maybe we can just address. Ooh, do deciduous trees tend to be healthier than conifers or vice versa? Or is it about the same for both types? Well, here's what I would say, but I'm gonna ask Trent for some backup on this one too. So I'll, I'll get my first in and then I'll let the expert uh, correct me. <laughs> what I would say is that uh, the the coniferous trees, they're going to have a longer photosynthesis cycle. So they're going to be providing more of their own food for the winter. Um, when you're taking a look at reasons to plant trees, your conifers are also really good for helping home heating if you plant them as a windbreak. Um, in terms of deciduous trees, I mean, a lot of the diseases and pests that we hear about are specifically targeted at deciduous trees. Um, I'm not familiar with any particular pests and diseases that have a penchant for conifers, and this is where Trent might be able to help us out. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, you know, I think uh, when it comes to an urban forest standpoint, I, I recommend planting as much as you can of both, right? Uh, diversity is kind of key uh, in, in having a healthy landscape. Um, there is one kind of conifer that comes to mind that was overplanted, and that's the blue spruce. And now we have uh, something called the needle cast fungus, which is affecting um, not so much London yet, but uh, a lot of the parts of the GTA. Uh, and it's uh, it's kind of becoming a the, the normal daily removal uh, is a blue spruce. Uh, because of this fungus and it just spreads from tree to tree um so i don't know if i'd recommend um one over the other i'd reckon i kind of would would ask what the purpose of the tree would be uh for your yard um, if you're looking for year-round um privacy um, or even shade then obviously you're probably going to look at more of a conifer because uh, it doesn't lose its uh needles or, or leaves in the in the winter However, a deciduous tree would. Um, so again, it's kind of what your your preference or what the purpose of the tree is for uh, for you or for your family. But, uh, Jake, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, not really. You know, I really like what you said about diversity because that's one of the other things that reforest really focuses on as well. Like you're never going to see a reforest team plant a monoculture, right? Because in nature, Absolutely. they just don't exist. They're not. They're not healthy um <laughs> yes they're, absolutely they're not self-sustaining um so you know if if you can find um complementary species um you know and just have as much biodiversity as possible it's going to ensure that um no matter what threats come your way you're always going to have some part of your garden there to brighten your day for you absolutely and you know what i think um if you are in the London area, I think Reforest London has a species, like a recommended species list uh, on their website um, that uh, that landowners or in residents of London can, can actually go and take a look at. Um, they're, they're all native species. They're, they're great for um, kind of your, your yard and they provide kind of an ecological benefit uh, for the surrounding environment. That's great, guys. I think um, in the... Uh, just for timing, a lot of questions are coming in and it's probably too many to answer right now. So for the interest of time, 
we'll just keep going. And then if there's any questions at the end, people can stay after seven or uh, we can even email if need be, if for those who can't stay. But um, thanks so much, guys. That's awesome. All righty. So our first uh, predator here is the emerald ash borer. You know, this is one of those things that I think is just terrible because when I look at this bug, it's a really pretty bug. I mean, just looking at the thing, I kind of like it, but then I discover that it's killing all our trees, uh, all of our ash trees. So it's got this metallic glitter thing going on. It does take one to three years uh, for the borers to bring a tree down entirely. Um, and it's only the larvae that do that. Um, we'll show you how they do it on the next slide here, uh, if you want to advance for us. Um, so this particular slide is about how to identify an ash tree um, so that you know what you're looking for. And by the way, if any of you go on to become tree specialists or tree teachers, um, Reforest London, like once these guys can do the tree hikes for you again, I highly advise getting into this program and becoming uh, a tree teacher because you get to walk through the Westminster ponds and be quizzed by experts. What kind of tree is that? What kind of tree is that? What kind of tree is that? So what they're showing you here in these four little clips are all of the tools um, that people use to identify trees, right? We look at the bark um, because with our uh, our deciduous trees, they don't have our they don't have leaves in the winter. So in the winter, you got to identify them by the bark. You can also identify them by the buds. You can identify them by the leaf pattern. Um, and you can uh, also identify them by the, the, the fact that their, their branches are sort of um, evenly spaced as well. Like, um, so that whenever a branch grows on one side, there's gonna be one that grows on the other. Um, so these are kind of paired leaflets. Um, that's what an ash tree looks like. So, you know, what you want to do when you get this PowerPoint is take a look at this picture and then go out to all the trees around you, identify which ones are the ash ones, and then just keep eyes on them for signs of what's coming in the next slide. And there it is. So, um, what you're seeing from the top left, uh, those are the exit holes where the larvae come out of the tree once they've done their thing. Thing. Down in the bottom right, what you will see is what it looks like underneath the bark of that tree. While those larvae are underneath that bark, eating these little paths that basically sever the connection um, between the tree and its bark. Um, they interfere with the transmission of water through the tree and all kinds of other things. And then you see uh, after you've had those two that we've looked at for long enough, you start to see what you're seeing in the top right, which is where it's losing its leaves. And then if you look in the bottom left, that's where we had, I think it was Julia who was talking earlier about the leaves growing around the bottom of the tree to indicate stress. And that's what's happening here. This tree is trying really hard to live. It's kicking out new branches at the base because that's the only place where it can and um, it's, it's, it's not going to be enough. Next. So what you are seeing here is a professional arborist. That might even be Trent. Had your picture taken lately? Um, who is trying to remove some of the infected parts of the tree. Um, the picture on the left-hand side is where they're using trees in. Um, to try and treat the tree. Um, this is a pesticide that is injected directly into the tree. Um, but DBH, by the way, um, means diameter at breast height. That's really important. So, um, you know, at sort of that four to four and a half foot mark, does your tree have a diameter of 25 centimeters or more? If so, it's a candidate for triazin. If not, it isn't. Um, and it also should have 70% of its crown remaining. Otherwise, um, even with the triazin, it might not survive its own photosynthetic deficiency. So, next up, 
other diseases, uh, pests and diseases, Japanese beetles. Um, Japanese beetles like to eat leaves. And so, I mean, as they're eating the leaves, the tree isn't getting the photosynthesis that it needs. Um, you can see what these little guys look like. Um, I do not know as much about these guys as I do about the borer. Um, but what I do know is that there are some plants that are particularly susceptible to Japanese beetles, and there are some other plants that are particularly resistant. So let's take a look at that on the next slide. There you go. So your American elders and Eastern red cedars, you guys can see the list there. I don't need to read the whole thing for you. Um, but the trees on the left-hand side are the ones that kind of, not only are they resistant themselves, they kind of um, encourage the beetle to go elsewhere because it doesn't really like those particular plants. Um, when you take a look at the trees on the right hand side of the screen though, uh, those are trees that the Japanese beetle likes. And so if, if you think you're going to have a problem with these guys, um, you know, I mean, if your neighbors have had problems with them or um, if, if you know that there have been problems in your neighborhood, you might want to stick to the trees on the left hand side of the page. So, um, the ways to control, um, you see the person with a spray bottle and really, there, I don't think that that's intended to be an actual pesticide. Uh, I think the idea is that they're just, they're like, they're getting the bugs off the leaves. You can see in the picture below, you've got somebody who's like actually picking that Japanese beetle off the tree. Um, you can see what the larvae are and, and where they grow. They kind of, you know, they grow under the surface close to the root. Um, do you have any other suggestions for looking after Japanese beetles, Trent? Have you dealt with these guys a lot? Um, a little bit, you know, they're kind of, they're, they're a pain, that's for sure. Um, definitely, they, you know, a lot of trees will survive an infestation of any types of um, any type of pest. Uh, I'm dealing right now with a lot of honey locust issues. Um, the past three years have been really bad for leafhoppers and honey locust beetles, um, and they're just a kind of soft-bodied um, insects. But the tree does recover. It might look a little gnarly for a while, but it, it will recover. Um, Japanese beetles uh, they have a harder shell, um, and and I'm with you guys and definitely kind of not using uh, pesticides and things like that, insecticides, but what you could use is something like uh, insecticidal soap. Um, and uh, there's people even that have been making it their own at home, but uh, you can buy it uh, if it's tree specific, um, even at home hardware and things like that. Uh, if you have a smaller shrub that's infested with Japanese beetles. Um, uh, my recommendation is just kind of monitor and uh, get, get an assessment um, if you're seeing a, a, a huge infestation um, where your tree is actually declining. Right. Okay. So there are all kinds of other pests and diseases that, um, you know, we're just talking about really wildlife here. When you've got the picture of the dog, the one that you, you're not seeing there is the voles. Uh, voles will nibble at the bark around the base of the tree kind of thing. Um, so what you see in the picture on the top left is that they've got a sleeve that they've put around the tree. These are really cool. They're actually made of cellulose and they're translucent so sunlight gets through them. Um, but they, they prevent predators from like nibbling on the leaves or nibbling on the buds um, or tearing off whole branches. So, you know, if you're planting a vulnerable tree and it's not inside a fenced in enclosure where you can sort of limit the access of pests, um, you might want to consider one of those sleeves. Um, this stuff down at the bottom there, scoot, that they talk about is, um, it's not a particularly harsh 
repellent. Um, it's not a, it's not like a, a super, super nasty chemical that's going to harm the tree. Um, but it does tend to keep away animals who might want to eat the tree because um, I think it just smells bad. Um, and so, and then there's that fence line in there. And I think that what they're talking about again is, you know, a tree that grows close to that fence is probably going to end up like that tree that we saw in the slide earlier. Um, so, you know, I mean, just an awareness of those things. Um, are there a lot of rabbits in your neighborhood? Are there a lot of squirrels in your neighborhood? Are there voles in the neighborhood? Have you seen them? Um, have they eaten other things that you've tried to plant in your garden? If you guys are growing food, you're going to know whether you've got predators that are stealing it or not. Um, and, you know, you, you got to take issues to protect, uh, take, take measures to protect yourself against that stuff. So um, those tree collars are pretty amazing though. We use them a lot. Okay, next up, I think we are getting closer. So the Asian longhorn beetle, um, we have not heard a lot about this guy yet, which is a very good thing um, because it has a far more voracious appetite than the emerald ash borer, which restricts itself to ash trees. Um, the Asian longhorn will attack nearly all broadleaf trees. Yes, it prefers native maples, but really no one's safe. Um, again, it is another uh, invasive species, and so it has no natural predators. That's the thing that makes it deadly. There's nothing out there trying to eat it. So it can just reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and reproduce um, without any fear of population decline and it could overwhelm our forests if we're not careful. So if you ever see one of those guys and it has distinctively long antennae, uh, make a note of the, the time, the date, and the location. Contact the city, let them know that you saw one. If you happen to be able to catch the sucker and put it in a jar, even better, um, because people are going to want to know if these things come to our city. Um, next. So now we've got some uh, other sort of cosmetic diseases. These things typically aren't as fatal for trees, um, but they're certainly not attractive. They tend to be growths that you'll see on the leaves. Um, and I mean, they all, they're all different. They all, they have different causes and stuff. And again, I'm not a huge expert in this area. Um, as a non-gardener myself. But what I can tell you is that they do um, tend to be fatal far, far, far less than some of the other pests that we've talked about, if they're ever fatal at all. They just look bad. Um, now, Trent, feel free to step in there and correct me if I messed it up, though. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. It's uh, purely cosmetic, really. Uh, yeah, no, it's great. Okay. So, Dutch elm disease. Now, we went through that one a long time ago, and if you take a look at that tree, you'll see it's got, um, like, the same kind of scoring that we saw from the ash borer larvae. Uh, looks like it has happened to this tree, but I it's, yeah, it's spread by a bark boring beetle, right? So again, they're doing exactly the same thing that the ash borer does, but they're doing this to elm trees uh, as opposed to ash trees. And yeah, it's deadly. Um, they didn't give us a timeline here, but I think Dutch elm actually is faster than the borers. Um, I remember we went through this one. This was the first... Uh, big tree crisis that I had ever heard about and it was actually before I started working with Reforest London um, and I haven't heard much about it lately oak wilt um, is something that we've heard about that is uh, this is a little newer 
Um, I only heard about this thing, I think two years ago was the first time I heard about it. It is a fungal disease and specifically the way that it hurts trees is by interrupting the flow of water and nutrients. Um, it is spread above ground uh, via beetles. It is spread below ground via interconnected roots of infected and healthy trees. So, you know, those trees, they need to social distance um, and not touch other roots in order to prevent the transmission of oak wilt. Um, it is deadly. It begins with the wilting and the bronzing of leaves and all species of varieties and oaks are susceptible. Again, only oaks, but all oaks. Um, so it has the potential to be disastrous. So what I would recommend is if you're planning on planting a bunch of oak trees, do not plant them close together. Um, because if their roots ever grow long enough to touch each other and one of them gets infected, you're going to lose both of them. Just want to add uh, something, if you don't mind. Um, I uh, I was in Michigan for an oak wilt certification um, course, and uh, it's unbelievable. You'll go down there two weeks um, prior, and then you'll go down two weeks later, and that same tree was green. Uh, it's now completely defoliated. It's actually a pretty a uh, scary disease uh, and something we definitely don't want here. Wow, it's that fast, eh? Oof. That's crazy. Um, again, you know, I, I haven't seen a lot of it here, um, but I kind of scaled back my planting responsibilities last year too and focused on a couple of other things. And this year was supposed to be my triumphant return to tree planting at large. Funny how that works. Okay, next up. <laughs> uh, so tar spots. Uh, again, caused by fungi, really, really ugly to look at, but generally not harmful. Um, however, there is something you can do to prevent them, which is if you've had a tree that's been infected with these through the growing season, when all the leaves start to fall, make sure you rake them up and uh, destroy them because if you can do that you will prevent the spores from reproducing over winter and um, you know underneath the snow um, then when it melts that that fungal uh, issue is still present after the winter season because the spores have just been underneath the snow waiting um, so rake them up Destroy them. Um, destroying them is good because remember, if you're throwing them away, wherever they get thrown, uh, the tar spots are going to take root there. So, next. Other leaf spots. And again, you know, just like uh, the other ones that we were looking at, you know, they do tend to be cosmetic. And nobody likes them very much, but they are generally survivable. For your trees um, but there there's a tremendous amount of variety in leaf spots I guess is the thing to take away here um, because we've seen quite a few different types <laughs> other threats because you know life wasn't hard enough so black walnut toxicity, the idea here is that um, certain kinds of trees, if they're planted close to black walnut trees, will have a very, very, very hard time um, because the, the, the walnuts themselves are that, you know, as they rot and decay, they're actually toxic. Um, to those sensitive trees. So your crab apples, your basswoods, your European alders, those trees are going to have a really hard time growing close to black walnuts. Whereas the trees on the left-hand side are all pretty resistant to that kind of stuff. So, you know, when you hear Trent and, uh, and any of the reforest people or me talking about having a diverse uh, set of plants in an area to sort of help and support each other, you know, if one of them is a walnut, just a black walnut, just be aware that 
those trees under that sensitive list are not good community trees to share space with that black walnut. Road salts. So if you're going to plant a tree beside your driveway or beside a road, it is likely to come in contact with road salt. If you're not planting it beside your driveway or beside the road, it will not be as likely to come in contact with road salt. So uh, along your driveways, that's where you want your junipers, your large tooth aspens and your red oaks. Um, whereas, you know, in your protected backyard where no road salt goes, that's where your cranberry trees and your, and your birch and your silver maples and your basswoods can go um, because they're far more tolerant. The other thing we know, and I think this is actually on the next slide, is that there are alternatives to road salt. What's up next? Yes. So um, they do have environ melt, um, which is specifically designed to be a little bit more friendly to trees. The old standby sand is better for trees than salt, um, obviously. And if you eat a whole lot of pickles, because you'd have to eat a whole lot of pickles to get enough pickle juice uh, to use it this way, but apparently pickle juice works well too. Um, so those are some of your alternatives to road salt. And last but not least, we arrive in bylaws. So in London, um, like within the protected area of the city of London, and I'm not sure about the, the, the boundary of the bylaw, um, but what they're looking at, there's that DBH again, which is diameter at breast height. Um, it has to be greater than 50 centimeters. Um, and those are the ones that we want to protect. Uh, if they're if they're greater than 50 and the reason why if they're if they've got a, a diameter of greater than 50 centimeters that tree had to live a very 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 long time to get that large and if it were cut down the replacement tree might not ever live long enough to get that big um, so and the bigger the tree is of course the more carbon dioxide it pulls out of the air um, the more environmental benefit it has for us um, and also for, you know, all of our animal species that need those trees for homes and shelters. Um, this, you know, these things, it's, it's to a lot of people who are developers and stuff, it seems inconvenient. But when you take a look at the connections between the trees and the animals, it starts to make sense why these huge, huge trees are so important to us. They are homes to hundreds of animals that most of the time we don't even see, um, you know, and they're, and they're doing that, that hard work, pulling that carbon dioxide out of the air for us. So we want to protect them. And there is a phone number down here that you should write down because if you see somebody chopping down one of these trees um, that looks like it has a diameter of greater than 50 centimeters, uh, you should call London's Tree Protection Office and just find out the person who's cutting it down may be authorized to do so. Um, they may be doing it to create uh, fire safe corridors. They may be doing it to um, reduce tree borne diseases. They may be doing it for a lot of reasons. So they may have permission, but you won't know if you don't call. And um, I would advise against going over to the person and talking to them about it because that can lead to confrontation and we want everybody to be safe um, but there's that number and email address so lots of ways to get a hold of them if you see somebody who's in violation okay and next up boulevard trees any tree on a boulevard is protected from injury or damage even if it doesn't have a breast height of 50 centimeters or sorry a, a diameter at breast height of 50 centimeters um, if it's on a boulevard, it's protected. If you are a homeowner, you can actually make a request to the city to have a tree planted on the boulevard. And you can even make a specific species request. 
It is not guaranteed that the city is going to be able to honor your specific species request, but they will do their best to accommodate you. And of course, they're looking to plant trees that have the best chance of survival as well. Um, so if you want a particular tree because it's pretty and they want a particular tree because it's likelier to live, they win. Uh, okay, next up. Okay. Do you want to talk about this, Kelsey? I heard you there. Yeah, I'll hop in. Yeah, so that's about it for this. Uh, I apologize that we went over the time that we were expecting. This is typically an hour and a half long, and we thought, oh, it'll probably go faster because it's a webinar, but it was great to have a lot of questions. So for those who um, still want to stay and hear the questions answered, um, we can stay you know, a little longer. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to mention that if you liked this event, um, there are more of them. So next, oh, actually this Thursday, there's one put on by the Canadian Freshwater Alliance and it's all about volunteering um, online. So right now it's hard to volunteer in person because pretty much everything is canceled, but this is, um, it's made for their volunteers, but it's applicable to anybody. So for instance, if you're a Reforest London volunteer, um, this is about how you can support, um, you know, protecting natural spaces and things like that um, by doing online engagement. So that's this Thursday. And then next week, we have two more uh, being organized by the Thames Tavel Land Trust. One is all about frogs and toads. Um, so a good one for the kids too. <laughs> um, and then it's part two of their native plant gardening um, series. And this one is native plant gardening for wildlife. So that's next Tuesday and next Thursday at 6 p.m. Um, and then see also our Seeds to Forest program. Just want to give a shout out to uh, Juliana, who's actually on the call, um, who coordinates our Seeds to Forest program. Um, definitely check that out on our website too if you have any kids, because we have a lot of great um, activities that you can do at home. So visit reforestlondon.ca to check those out. Um, and if you ever have any questions about uh, the Signal Boost, webinars, just let me know at signalboost at reforcelearn.ca. Okay, so that's everything. And now, um, yeah, if you want, we can stay for another few minutes and answer some questions. Once again, shout out to Ontario Trillium Foundation. And um, yeah, thanks so much for sponsoring us. Thank you so much to everybody for joining us too. And thank you so, so much to both Jake and Trent for taking this on. Um, it's always great, especially to, to keep some volunteers engaged and have them join us. Um, yeah, so thanks very much. Lots of fun. Okay. So I guess I'll just start looking at the, the questions. Yeah, some of the stuff that, uh, that Trent wrote in the sidebar there. So uh, michiganoakwilt.org. Um, could be a really good site to check out if you want to know a little bit more about oak wilt. Um, but what's really cool is Trent also uh, in there mentioned to us that it hasn't been found in Ontario yet. So uh, good news on that front. Fingers crossed. Right. Okay, one question I found here. Are there any other insects that would leave a similar pattern of chewing a chewing trail on other trees too? Or is that size and pattern more commonly emerald ash borer? So I think it's in regards to the ash borer. Are there any insects that would make a similar, um, I guess, yeah, path, a chewing trail? <laughs> well, certainly we saw similar things with the uh, Dutch elm. Like when we saw that pattern underneath and, and, and then it said in the sidebar as well that, that that one in particular was also created by uh, bark boring beetles. Um, those are the, but that would be the only other one that I know about. Yeah, I think that's right. Actually, uh, just any bark boring beetles or um, tree boring beetles like a lash borer and there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, would, would make the same kind of, um, I guess, uh, they're called beetle galleries, as they call. Uh, very cool to see. Not great for the tree, but very cool to look at. So um, that sounds like 
that's about it. If there's any other questions, reach out to us. I'll take another look, see if there's any we missed and we can always reach out. But um, otherwise, thanks again, everybody. And have a good night. Shi miigwech, Yongo, thank you, and merci beaucoup for sharing some information about trees. Yeah, Happy great job, uh, great job, Jake. That's awesome. Absolutely. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Have a great night, everybody.